while you've got your Bibles, you guys can turn with me quickly to Luke. Turn to Luke chapter 7. Okay, church, let us just open up in prayer quickly. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have a moment to gather around your word. Lord, I thank you that we have an opportunity to, to hear a brother speak about the calling on his life and the great urgency of the gospel placed on his heart. Lord, my prayer is that you give us the same urgency, that through your Holy Spirit you speak to our hearts to share the gospel with our neighbors. Lord, as we approach your word, as we approach this time, I pray that you be glorified, that you be magnified, Christ, in your name. Amen. So last week I preached a sermon about having a seat at the table of the Feast of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you who weren't there, or for those of you who've forgotten, um, I, I emphasize that listening to the Gospel is not enough. That we must be doers of the Word of God, prepared to share the Gospel in season and out of season. To share the Gospel when we are fully rested, as well as when we are in a state of exhaustion. And then I pointed out there are two feasts or two banquets, a feast of the flesh that leads to death and a feast of the Holy Spirit which leads to eternal life. And so this morning I'm expanding on the feasts. I'm expanding on this thought. This morning I'm going to talk about motivation. You see, many of us find ourselves in a position where we want to act and we want to do God's Word. But we often find ourselves doing so in our own strength. We often find ourselves trying to accomplish this as good works. Quickly we find ourselves wanting to appear righteous. We're not actually so concerned about being righteous anymore. We just want to, we don't want them to know. We want to appear righteous. Quickly we find ourselves wanting to be at the table of the Holy Spirit on Sunday. But come Tuesday, we devour the fruits of the flesh in our daily lives. Sexual sins, pornography, impure morals, excessive appetites, replacing God in our lives with other things, witchcraft, having hate in our hearts, loving a fight with others, being jealous of others. Being uncontrollably angry, creating division amongst people, doing whatever it takes to get ahead, following your own truth and not God's truth, drunkenness or endless partying. This is just a taste of the fruits of the flesh found in Galatians chapter 5. That's where that list comes from. Are these more closely associated with us during the week than the fruits of the Spirit? How do we take a seat at this table of the Holy Spirit? How do we get ourselves to feast at the right table? And so today's sermon is titled, A Reason to Take a Seat. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 7 from verse 36. From verse 36, it's, it's quite a famous story, and read with me all the way through to verse 50. Verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she'd learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet weeping she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this he said to them said to himself if this man were a prophet he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. 
And he answered and said, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors, one who owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay it, he cancelled the debt of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he cancelled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I have entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What does this have to do with taking a seat at the table? And this is my first point, repentance. I'm going to go through three R's. The first R, repentance. Admission to the table of Christ is only through repentance. All are welcome to the table of the Holy Spirit. But admission is only granted to those who have repented. May we be a people who are quick to repent. Notice in the story, notice in this account, the woman was not invited to the feast. Simon, this Pharisee, he would never have invited a sinner to this feast because that would take his righteousness and put his righteousness at risk. As a Pharisee, they believe that you have to be separated from sinners. And so this this Pharisee would never have risked his righteousness by inviting this woman. And so we see a party crasher, a banquet bandit, if you would, interrupts this party. But Simon, he doesn't throw a fuss. He doesn't make a scene. What Simon does, Simon is noticing the reaction of Jesus. Because if you read early in this chapter, if you look at what comes just before in chapter 7, Jesus is respected at this time because of the miracles he's performing. Just early in this chapter, he raises a son from the dead. And so the Pharisee is sussing him out. Simon is actually questioning the authenticity of Jesus' credentials. As actually much of us do the same when a new pastor is in town. You sort of, you suss him out. You you, you want to see the fruits. And so the the Pharisee is actually looking at Jesus saying, are you really who you say you are? That's actually the heart of his question. You see, what I'm reminded of in this story is, you know the famous parable in Luke 18 verse 9, where Jesus, he gives us this parable of two people praying, the Pharisee and the the tax collector. And, and, The Pharisee prays and he says, thank God I am not like other men. The tax collector says, God, help me, be merciful to me. And then Jesus explains that it is only the tax collector who was justified. And so what I see in the story is you've got this Pharisee who's sussing out Jesus, but you actually, you have a woman who is a sinner who repents without saying a word. The woman doesn't speak in the story, yet her sins are forgiven. I find that fascinating. Because what we see here, this woman repents without saying a word. Because repentance is not saying sorry. Repentance is a changed life. 
You see, repentance is not an empty promise saying, I will do better. Repentance is saying, God help me because I cannot help myself. Repentance is not improvement. Repentance is death to your old life and new life in Christ Jesus. You see, repentance is not just the mere acknowledging of your wrong. Repentance is allowing the Holy Spirit to change you. It's important. And so how do we get admission to this table, this feast of the Holy Spirit? Repentance. What, what stands out in this passage is that it's a continuing thing. The woman doesn't kiss the feet once. The woman doesn't just cry a few tears and then stops. I think how Paul says, how have you started in the Holy Spirit and now you seek to continue in your own works? How did we start with the Holy Spirit? Only by repentance. How do we continue in the Holy Spirit? Only through repentance. May we be a people who are quick to repent. May we be a people quick to repent. Notice verse 45. Look at verse 45 with me. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. The first step is repentance. There is no salvation without repentance. There is no admission to the table unless we repent. This is the gospel. The gospel is, is this simple. Repent because Jesus died for your sins. Believe in Jesus because he died for your sins. Through faith in the death and resurrection of Christ, you have eternal life. Take your seat at the table through repentance. But here comes my second point. The first step in being seated and having the reason to stay seated at the table is through repentance. But my second point here is resistance. Resistance. Look at verse 39 with me. Verse 39 says, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. Now what we see here, Simon is not making a scene or a fuss. He's not even talking to anyone. Look at verse 39. How does it start? Now the Pharisee said to himself. He, because we need to understand for a Pharisee who knows Moses' law, this is a very rational question. He's asking, well, if he's meant to be this prophet, surely he's, you know, he's got to know what I know. He's got to know what I know. And, and what we see here is that it's a, this Pharisee, Simon, has this rational thought of, well, if you are who you say you are, surely you would know who this is. You've just raised someone from the dead in chapter 7, early in this chapter. How do you not know what kind of person is touching you? How often is this the same case with us? How often is it that religious people are the most resistant to grace? May we be a people who are so quick to submit to the Holy Spirit. Let me, exp let me ask you a very simple question this morning. Who had more sin? The Pharisee or the woman? How is sin measured in the eyes of God? One of, my, one of the songs I really enjoy listening to, it has lyrics that it says this. It says, we are all the same people with sinning hearts, and that's what makes us equal. How much sin does it take to send your soul to hell? You see, the problem with Simon was that 
he didn't... The problem in the story is not that Simon didn't have enough sin. We need to read that carefully in the story. The problem was that he did not realize how truly sinful he was. You see, the story Jesus tells, and he tries to make it clear to Simon in this parable of the two debtors, we notice Simon's response is, well, I suppose, I guess, I guess it's got to be the other guy. Have a look there. Have a look at verse 43. It says, the one, I suppose, for whom he cancelled the larger debt. Simon is missing the point here. You see, the consequence of these two debtors is the same. The one owes 500, the other 50, but the consequence would have been the same for them both. It would have been slavery or jail. The difference between the two is the one could justify, justify away his guilt. The one who only owed 50 could say, oh, it's not so bad, it's just a little bit of debt. The one could reason away his wrong. The one could say, oh, it's, it's, it's just not so bad. You see, the problem here is not that the woman and the Pharisee had more or less sin. Jesus is not comparing the amount of sin. Because we know the wages of all sin is death in Romans. The issue here at hand is that we've got this woman and this Pharisee with different responses to the same Savior. Why? And what Jesus points out is he says, he and we see this is that oftentimes we allow religion and theology to interfere with our response to God. That doesn't mean religion and theology are bad. The law of Moses wasn't bad. But the Pharisee allowed it to interfere with the appropriate response to God. Let me, let me show it to you in the story. This Pharisee was so busy in the beginning, in verse 39, he was so busy assessing Jesus, looking for his credentials, his authenticity, that he did not respond to Jesus appropriately. That's what we see later, where Jesus says, but I came and you didn't even give me water for my feet. He was so busy trying to assess this prophet, he didn't focus on his response to the person. He was so busy critiquing Jesus, he did not welcome him properly. Jesus says, I came and you didn't even welcome me a kiss, which is the custom of that time to welcome them. He was so busy, focused on seeing if I'm who I am, that you forgot the proper response. Are we perhaps caught in the same boat as Simon? Are we sometimes so caught up with the technicalities of the faith, the theology of what we believe, that we have diluted the simple truth of by faith through grace? Child of God, do not resist the move of the Holy Spirit. If you are battling to produce fruit, of the Spirit in your daily life. If Monday to Friday is this drought of being at the feast of the Holy Spirit, perhaps, like this Pharisee, you are stuck resisting what God is wanting to do. It is not, uh, Damien actually said it really well, it's not our works that save us. It's not you who needs to produce this fruit. And so if you're struggling to see the fruit, perhaps you're stopping the one who produces it. Perhaps you're allowing something in your life to resist the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you. My first point is we get access to this table through repentance. But oftentimes we resist the move of the Holy Spirit through technicalities. And now my final point is the reason. I struggled with this. Reason or response both apply. But I want to quickly 
I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 14. There's a passage here that applies very well. John chapter 14, verse 15. And this is what it says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live. You will also live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest himself, myself to him. If you are struggling to live a life changed, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, I have to ask, I must ask about your love for the Lord. That's the passage we read now. Jesus himself ties a changed life to love for him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You see, in the story of this sinful woman and this Simon the Pharisee, we see the sinful woman demonstrates her obedience to Christ because of her love. That's what we see when Jesus says, therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven because she loved much. She demonstrated her repentance and obedience. The sinful woman goes to Jesus in verse 47, and, and Jesus says, for she loved much. For she loved much. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that because she understands her deep depravity, she is capable of loving deeply, of obeying deeply. You see, the problem in this passage is that Simon thinks he has a small problem. He has a little bit of sin. And so the capacity of his love, his obedience, remains small. If you are struggling with staying at the table of the Holy Spirit, perhaps it's because you have a mistaken view of your own righteousness. Perhaps it's because you don't see your sin accurately. Now, I want to be very clear. This morning, I am not magnifying sin. I'm not magnifying sin. What I'm really trying to do is, I want you to correctly see what sin is. I'm attempting to help you understand the true impact sin has. Because this story teaches that once we understand the impact of sin, it's only then that we start to realize how incredible, how wonderful, how amazing, how vast, how majestic, how wonderful the grace is that has been given to us in Jesus Christ. Imagine with me a massive canyon. And there's people on two sides. There's the goal, the destination on the right, and, and your starting point on the left. And this canyon is filled with all sorts of obstacles. The one at the starting point looks ahead and says, it's impossible, I cannot. The one at the, fishing, at the finish line looks back and says, I don't know how, but how good is my God? That is sort of what I'm trying to do. 
I don't want you to be at the starting point looking and saying, the sin is, the obstacle is so big. I want you to be at the finish line looking back and saying, my God overcame even that. The reason that keeps you at the table, the motivation to stay feasting at the table of the Holy Spirit comes out of understanding how deep sin runs inside of us. Understanding how deep the impact of our sin truly is. As we are approaching Easter or Passover, surely now is a time more than ever to understand the depravity where we started from. Praise the Lord we're not there still. Praise the Lord that He's already changed and He's walked a journey with us. But surely now is a good time to reflect and to ask ourselves, Lord, how great is the change you have brought in me? If I look back personally on my own life, it's nice to have some people in the congregation who, who know a bit of my past. And I think, I was so lost. I still struggle with sin. I still suffer. I still wrestle with that fleshly man on the inside and I beat him away. Some days I succeed, some days I fail. But if I take a step back and I look on my life and I see where God has taken me from, how can I doubt that He's going to continue taking me through? How can I doubt that He will finish the change, He will finish the work He has started in me? That's the reason. That's what it's all about. Have a look at verse 50. It hasn't changed. Nothing's changed. Verse 50, what does Jesus say to this woman? Your faith. What is Jesus saying to you this morning? Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Take a moment this morning. If you are struggling, if, you are, if, you, if life is not going well, and, and you just see so many fruits of the flesh still evident in your life, Repent. Do not resist. Your faith has saved you. I can only echo the words of Zechariah in verse, chapter 4, verse 6, when he says, Not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. That's the reason we stay at the table during the week. Not by efforts, not by power, not by might. But this is the word of the Lord. If you read Zechariah, that's where it starts with the word of the Lord. And then it echoes it with the spirit of the Lord. It's a beautiful passage. You cannot take a seat at the table of everlasting life unless you repent. You cannot stay at that table if you always resist the Holy Spirit. But join me at the table because man, my God, my Jesus has done so much. He has saved me from so much. I don't love Him because He did so much for me. I also love Him because He loved me first. Do, do we realize that? Do we understand properly that in our sin we couldn't even love the debtor? In this example, the analogy falls short because the debtor loves because he is saved. We couldn't even get to that point because of our sin. That's how blinded we were. We love because he loved us first. But when you realize how much he has done, your love increases for him. As your love increases for him, the fruits flow out of your life. Love is evidenced in action. That's what we see in the story. That's exactly the point. The sinful woman comes to him and how do we know that she loves Jesus? This whole account, she doesn't say a word. Love is evidenced in action. What does she do to demonstrate her love? She weeps. 
She cries. She kisses. She wipes. It's not a pretty picture. They walked everywhere. There weren't no cars, no shoe shiners. Her love is evidenced in her action. And so the only question at the end of this is how will you respond to what he has done for you? It's as simple as that. The gospel is that simple. Let us pray. Lord, there's so much we can learn in a story like this. We didn't even scratch the surface. But the most important thing here is we've got two people who meet with Jesus and two very different responses. Lord, Father God, I ask you that you give us the grace to respond as the woman did to kiss your feet without ceasing to hold on to you with all that we have we thank you for your grace and your mercy in the mighty name of the lord jesus christ amen Amen. we're going to have communion now we're going to just take some time to adjust and get to the table Mm -hmm. And I just want to encourage you, communion is for all who've asked Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life. I think it's appropriate when we talk about the feast of the table of the Holy Spirit to include communion. I want to remind you of what this table really signifies. This table is symbolic. This table, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, what he was saying is, Take part of this as recognition, as identifying yourselves as a part of my body. That was the point of communion. To say, yes, Lord, you are who you say you are. We don't have to be as the Pharisee still critiquing and assessing his credentials. Jesus came. Jesus died. And he rose again. This is the Passover. This is the significant moment of Easter, what we celebrate today. Jesus has risen for for our sins. He's at the right hand interceding for you. And so let me just read from Scripture before we get into it. I'm reading from Mark. and, And it says, As they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, Take, this is my body. And that's the first step of what we do. We take the bread and we say, Lord, we know that we are participating in your body. So I'm going to ask David to bless and to pray over it. Yes, Father, as we we sang earlier, Father, our sins are many, Father. Um, Rich a man am I, Father. Yet your grace and and your mercy is more, Father. And as we we remember, Father, as you call us to remember, Father, Lord, let us sit at the table with you, Father, and bring us into that communion. Remind us of what you have done and why you have done it, Father. I pray over this this meal that we we partake, Father, and that, that, Lord, you would bless us once again, Father, with, with your grace, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
This is Jesus' body for you. It was beaten and broken for you. You may eat of the bread. And then Jesus, he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. That is what the cup is. If I can just ask Mark to pray over the cup. Father, we thank you that you gave your son for our sins. But not only that, Lord, you saw that it was that you would still continue to love us and that you would establish a new covenant in your blood, even though we're unworthy. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that in our hearts we celebrate that your love for us is so much that you continue to love us even when we're not worthy. We thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. This is the blood of Jesus that was shed for your sin. You may drink of the cup. I want you all to just take a moment and, and reflect. And this is how the Gospel of Mark ends the account. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruits of the wine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Our God, our Jesus, is victorious. He is the King of all kings. Just take a moment with Him now. Just a moment. So we close the service with this benediction found in Romans. And this is our prayer over you as the body of Christ. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord.